Hi, I'm Greg Banish from Calibrated Success. Today I'm at SCT and we're going to start a new project here talking about how we do some performance improvements, but also keep those performance improvements emissions compliant. And we're going to look at some of the things that help us get there. With me today, I have Matt Alderman from SCT. Say hi, Matt. Hello. Matt, tell us about our test subject that we're going to be using in this exercise here. So today we have one of the latest F-150s from Ford, uh, which recently, as we all know, Ford threw us kind of curveball. Uh, we were able to get around the security, so everything tunes just as it normally does with our tuning suite. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do some uh, normal upgrades that we would do with our tuning calibration process, um, measuring our emissions as we go to make sure that we're compliant. And then we're going to add a little bit extra to it um, for future proofing for when we go ahead and do some of our other upgrades by doing a set of injectors and showing the importance of having the right data for that part that you're putting on that vehicle. Awesome. So making horsepower, of course, everybody in the high performance industry knows we all love doing that. Yep. You guys have a pretty good reputation for having some tools and even preloaded cows that make very solid gains, but we also have been very environmentally responsible, right? So SCT, if we, if we look at the history, they've got a little bit of you know, dubious interaction with the EPA, but now what does being environmentally responsible mean to SCT? Well, right now it's a big important part of our business model. I mean, we're going in ahead and having third-party testing with like we're currently a SEMA garage. We're doing all of our in-house testing before we send, because as we know, there's no guarantees to any of that. So, okay, so getting that third-party evaluation and getting the testing allows you guys to apply for an EO. Yes. And when the EO is approved, now we are 50 state legal on something, right? So we can sell anywhere in the United States and know that our customers don't have to worry about any kind of bad interaction on emissions or enforcement or things like that. So that's pretty powerful, right? Absolutely. So not only are we making the performance, but we're keeping our emissions in, in check and the two are not mutually exclusive. Now to do that, we've got a, a series of tools at our disposal and you guys make a significant time investment before you release every one of these, right? Absolutely. We spend on average several months between the dyno and the street verifying, confirming, testing under various conditions. Awesome. So it's not an overnight process for you, right? Not by any means. Yeah, and, and I come from the OEM world. So for me, it's been years before something gets released. The cool part is you guys get to start with an OEM cow. Yep. And all you have to do is fix what we broke, right? So if we put new injectors in, we have to put in some new data that obviously represents them. Absolutely. And I think we're gonna be talking about that here, right? Because we did that on this truck. So so you sent me a set of injectors. I did, from Detworks. Yep, and so we tested those at the Calibrated Success Test Center using the fuel injector test bench. Now that test bench, yes, I do those testing for other injector resellers and other tuners, but I mean, you guys could put a bench in here if you wanted. Sure, sure. High sure. performance shops can get them. So let's go back to the Calibrated Success Test Center and let's look at what that testing process looked like before we go to the next step here, okay? Sounds good. Well, here we are in the shop and we have our fuel injector test bench from Calibrated Success, of course. And we've got a set of fuel injectors that we were shipped for this project. Now, we're not quite sure exactly how these injectors behave. Sure, somebody might tell me they flow a certain number of pounds per hour or grams per second, but that's only one small piece of the puzzle. And when it comes to doing calibration level work and not guessing, we need a little bit more information. So the cool part about this injector bench is we can take a set of relatively unknown fuel injectors and we can derive the exact complete characterization for that fuel injector in the exact format that we're gonna to need to use in our tuning software later. So before we start, the first thing we're gonna do is we got the injectors in, we've got fluid in the bench, is we're just gonna run a quick break-in procedure and let them make sure they're ready for testing. With the break-in complete, our next step is to see if all of these injectors flow similar to each other. And one of the features of this bench is to do what we call a balance test where it's gonna run all four injectors together simultaneously, and then it's sequentially gonna drop each one of the injectors throughout the firing order. And the computer on the background will take all of that data and process it and show us how each injector flowed compared to the ones in the set. So we just start that test here. And you see, it's gonna take about 10 seconds of running all the injectors together to get a good stable number out of them. And we know what they're doing here. And then you're gonna see it's gonna drop this first injector 
and it'll do that for a little while. And after it's got enough data on that one missing, it's gonna to go to the next injector in the firing order. It's gonna drop this one over here, just like that. It's gonna do that all the way through the process. We do this at a couple different pulse widths, and that gets us enough data to be confident on our flow matching. We take the raw data from our balance test, we put it through our online tool, and the tool gives us a graphical representation of what we would expect to see from these injectors and how we can compare them to each other. So on other benches, you may have seen where they actually fill up your rets and they have to eyeball them. This thing took all those measurements digitally, so it's even higher precision. And we can see that the average flow versus each of these green virtual burettes representing each injector. Even better is our software gives us a percentage difference between each injector. We do that at a very short pulse width and we do it at a longer pulse width here. So this one represents what you might see cruising around town. And this is kind of our wide open throttle separation between these injectors. You can see in both cases, these four injectors all match each other really close. So it's time to proceed with the flow measurement test. Now that we know all of our injectors are actually really close to each other, we know that we have a match set. Now it's time to go get the really good data, the actual characterization. So that characterization routine used to take us about eight hours to sit there and pulse the injectors and fill burettes and eyeball every single measurement and try and make it right and go into this giant spreadsheet. We've automated it all on this machine. So now the machine just collects the data on the fly. The whole test takes about 400 seconds. And all we have to do to kick it off is push this button right here for injector flow. And you see it's gonna prime it. And it's gonna start out by doing a complete sweep at 14 volts here. And then after it's done with this sweep, it's gonna do sweeps at additional voltages. And it's gonna get the complete workup of the injector at a series of different voltages being applied to the injector. And that's part of what helps us build those offset tables. And after that, it's gonna take another string of data at a whole bunch of steady state, but very small pulse widths to get all that non-linearity for the injector. So when we're building a Ford model, that's what helps us build the Ford offset, that low slope, and find the break point. When we bring all that together, we'll end up with our data sheet that we can plug back into the software. After we run our complete characterization test, we save all that data, we put it through our online processing tool, and the output of the tool is really cool at this point. Now we get something that looks exactly like a Ford Racing fuel injector calibration summary report. We generate the exact same thing that Ford would generate for their own fuel injectors. The difference is this data is tailored to this exact set of injectors. So a lot of you might be saying, well, why do I need this? I've already got data from my injector supplier. Your injector supplier might give you data that matches that part number based on a sample of injectors from that part number. But what we find is that in practice, different sets of injectors, even though they're matched really well to each other within the set, might be all together 4% high or 4% low from that average number. And so knowing that your injectors might be 4% off and knowing the exact flow rate and the exact offset and the exact nonlinearity, which is shown in this Ford data, by that low slope and the break point. Getting all that tailored to this exact set of injectors means that your car is gonna drive that much nicer on the first try when you just paste this data into your tuning software. It saves you a ton of time when you're tuning. Here we are in the dyno cell. Now the first thing you'll see is that this dyno cell is its own room. It's built inside of the rest of the building. These walls are actually part of an isolation chamber for this dynamometer versus the rest of the shop area here. So it looks a little bit different than your typical performance shop. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you on a little bit of walkthrough in this cell to show you what a proper emissions development cell looks like in the aftermarket. Even though it's not quite the same as what we use at the OE, this is pretty darn good. So let's look at some of the details that set this place apart. Inside the dyno cell, we're gonna see some differences here. So those of you who have followed along before with some of our training that we've put out before, remember that I'm a fan of having lots and lots of ventilation in your dyno cell. It does a couple things for us. Number one, it means that we're not getting those bad tailpipe gases sucked right back into the air filter. And number two, us human beings, we don't wanna be the canary in the coal mine. We do not wanna breathe the CO or all the other gases that are coming out the tailpipe. So to keep us healthy, we wanna flush this room a whole lot. Now, some of the other facilities we were at, we saw extraction systems that were roughly this big. Here, this is actually the inlet. 
So we have dedicated fresh air inlets to the cell with an equally large extraction system on the back end of the dyno cell that you can't see here, but it more than matches what we've got going on here. So we have the ability to flush this room with fresh air repeatedly and very quickly. The other thing that we have is this big guy here. This fan is far more capable than what we might see in a normal performance dyno shop. In fact, when we're doing baseline tuning, we can get away with a couple of those carpet dryer squirrel cage fans, just kind of blowing on the radiator in a cooler or whatever. And that's enough to keep it cool enough to do our work. But when we're simulating the emissions test, we wanna operate under conditions as close to what the test will be as possible. And for some of the tests, when we go to higher speeds on the SCO3 and the USO6 test, there's the option to run what they call a road load fan speed. And so this fan, the output of the fan in mile an hour is actually controlled by the dynamometer and it's matched to the rear wheel speed. So as the vehicle goes faster, the fan blows harder. And that's what the vehicle would theoretically see out on the road anyway. And it gives us a different cooling and potentially a different behavior from our engine. And we wanna match that. So as we test, we try and make our test look a lot like what we're going to have to certify with later. Now, although we're not a true 1065 lab here, this is one of those things that brings everything that much closer so that our work here helps us have more confidence that we'll pass later. Next up, let's take a look at our actual chassis dynamometer. In fact, that's kind of the foundation of our whole facility here. And we're lucky enough that this facility has, if you'll excuse the pun, quite the Cadillac of dynamometer setups in it. First thing we're gonna notice is it's not just a two-wheel drive dyno, we've got additional rollers. So we have the option to make this dynamometer four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. So they are linked front to rear wheel speed. So even if the thrust or braking is different axle to axle, they're forced to be at the same speed, the same way the vehicle would have front and rear speed the same out on the road. So this makes our test conditions more closely represent how the vehicles really use. And it also allows us to test vehicles that are not just two wheel drive. Now, certainly with trucks like this F-150, we can just put it in two wheel drive mode and use only the rear axle, but that's at our discretion. The next thing that's really cool about this dynamometer is the load control. So of course, one of my basic requirements is a load bearing dyno when we're doing ECU mapping because I wanna hold steady state testing. And so an eddy current gets us there when properly implemented on a lot of dynamometers. And so that lets us do most of our homework. But when we talk about running emission cycles and trying to replicate what's gonna happen on an actual CERT dyno in a laboratory, the coast down part of the test is a little bit different. And so we often need negative torque from the dyno. So the dyno is actually putting energy into the tires during some of the coast downs. And that requires something other than any current it needs an AC motor, which this dynamometer has. Now this addition of the AC motor does have some additional facility requirements and our facility luckily has it. At a bare minimum, we need 240 three phase power in order to run the AC motor for this system. Even better would be to have 480 three phase power. So we need to make sure our facility will support this before we commit to putting the dyno in or we're calling the electricians to try and make it happen. But once we've done that, we now have a dynamometer that can give us road load conditions that not only match our steady state driving down the road, but our positive and negative torques that we would see on the emissions test as well. The other thing that was really cool about this dyno setup is you see a lot of variables on my screen over there. A bunch of those variables are coming from our emissions measurement device. Let's take a look at that. When we're talking about taking emissions measurements, there's a bunch of tools that we use in our arsenals as calibration engineers and tuners. You guys can start adopting some of that as well. That technology is bleeding down from the OEMs out to the aftermarket, and it's bleeding down at a rate that is actually attainable and accessible to you guys. Now, when we talk about tools, there's this spectrum of tools. And way over on the basic end of the spectrum, we would start out with our wideband O2 sensors and in fact, many vehicles like this F-150 have wide bands, one on each bank, already integrated to the factory ECU. So it's really cool that we get that upstream air fuel ratio number because that's how we do most of our work. But when it comes to actually passing a test, the real 
measurement is way over here on this end of the spectrum with a 1065 bench in a laboratory. It's what they call a CVS column is the technology they use. Those things are millions of dollars in a climate controlled environment. We're using very special fuels when we run through it. It's literally counting molecules. Now that's out of reach. That's a little crazy. But in the middle ground in between them, we have access to things like five gas analyzers and this thing here in front of me, which is the VMAS system from Sensors Inc. So many of you have seen the five gas analyzer and we know we can get one of those for about $8,000 give or take nowadays. And it does give us CO and CO2 and oxides of nitrogen along with our air fuel ratio. Pretty cool. And for eight grand, it's kind of a bargain. One of the problems we run into when we're using a five gas is there's this very slow measurement time and a delay between what came into the thing and when we report a measurement. And time aligning that measurement to what we're actually doing in the vehicle makes all the difference because I wanna know if it happened while I was accelerating up in speed or after I let off and I'm now coasting at that speed. Those are two very different locations in the calibration and in the tuning maps for me to make an adjustment. This device starts to take all that noise out of it and gives us a little bit more accurate measurement. So what we've got is all the exhaust gases coming in and this isn't just raw exhaust gases, they've actually got an air pump, so it's dilute exhaust gases going in through a suite of sensors. And in here, we've got two major groups of sensors. So we've got an NDIR here capturing hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide and things like that, and our air fuel ratio. And then we've got an NDUV that gets us a couple different species of oxides of nitrogen here, and it knows how to separate those also from the ammonia. So between these two, we start to get relative concentrations of the bad things that could potentially come out the tailpipe. And this is stuff that you wouldn't necessarily get with your wideband O2. Now, these are just relative concentrations. And when I take the test on the far end of the spectrum with the CVS column, the rules are written such that the test needs to see grams per mile. And grams is a very definite mass measurement. It's not a percent of something, it is a raw number. So to get to a raw number from a relative concentration, I need a flow meter. And that's what this big box here is. So we're actually measuring how much flow goes through this and then multiplying it by a concentration of the various elements from these other sensing groups inside the device to get grams per mile out of this device. So this can actually give me the same kind of data that I would be getting at the CERT lab it's just in a much more affordable package. Now, granted, this is not 1065 compliant. It's not to the accuracy that's specified by the EPA. So this test alone does not guarantee that our results satisfy the EPA, but this is a heck of a way to study before you go take that test. So Matt, now we've set up our data logger and we've got our dynamometer set up for the FTP 75. You have your driver trace in front of you. We have the dyno's ventilation system running. Yep. We have our fan in front of the vehicle and our emissions sensors are ready to run behind the vehicle as well, tied into the dynamometer software. This is the magic hour. So we're going to start recording data now. So what's gonna happen is you're going to start the test on the dyno, which makes everything start recording. I will record here on LiveLink as well and you will start the vehicle. We will capture everything, including the cold start, all the way through the test. Okay. Start the vehicle, push the brakes and hold. Okay, there's our cold start. You pull it in the gear and you will follow the trace. So the cool part here is you're going to follow the trace and simultaneously we're getting our live link data over here. Everything can later be synced by looking at RPM mile an hour. This takes getting a feel for it. So there you go. Now on some of the D cells, yes, you need to use the brakes. Yeah, I noticed before, when I've tried it before, I used the brake it got real aggressive. But, now we're, the but remember the dyno is trying to run the AC motor to simulate the mass of the vehicle while it's running. Right, so. This should be more like what you would do out on the road than if you were just running the dyno in constant speed mode while you're tuning.
bring it down to zero. There you go, at stop, let the test expire. Now you can go to park. So the dyno should stop recording. We will stop recording on our laptop here. And we'll save that file. We'll come back and look at that yeah, and the emissions results. Yeah, I can switch it to that screen so that we can. Okay, and then we'll look at our emissions results on there. We'll keep this as our reference. And then we're ready to change parts yep. and do our normal tuning. And after doing our normal tuning, we'll come back and repeat this once we think we're ready. Yep. Cool. Yeah, okay, we just finished running our actual FTP 75 with our baseline configuration in the vehicle on the load bearing dyno. So the vehicle went through the same kind of process that it normally would in a certification lab. And we can start to see what happened. So over here on my left, I have my live link recording from the onboard data of the vehicle. And we can see this yellow trace is vehicle speed over time, which matches the FTP trace that we're trying to drive. And over here on the right, we have the Mustang Dyno software in the black trace here is my vehicle speed. You notice the black trace here and the yellow trace here both match. So we really did record the same data set in two places. And then on top of this over here, I'm able to add in these other channels. So in green, I have the instantaneous emissions measurements from our bench. So at any given moment, how much stuff is coming out of the tailpipe of the certain pollutants we care about. And then in blue below that, I have the accumulated total of those pollutants over time. And our certification values when we go to a lab is really grams per mile. So we take the total accumulated grams over the total accumulated miles throughout the test that was ratcheting up as we we're driving it. And I get a rough estimate of what my gram per mile was. Now remember, this is not a cert lab, but it gives us an indication. And remember, this is also our baseline test. So later on, after we've modified the vehicle, if we can make it look like this test, and so our accumulated totals don't ratchet up any higher than they did on this baseline test, we were probably in good shape. The Mustang software lets us click on it here and see the maximum value for all these things. So you can see my maximum distance was seven and a half miles and my maximum total for these different emissions things is listed here. I could take this number divided by the seven and a half and get grams per mile. Now, I also have a spike right here. So one of my pollutants spiked right here and you can see that my accumulated had a blip right there. Also during the cold start, most of our emissions happened in the cold start. We went from zero to 14 on this blue line right at cold start. Well, we could start honing in if we're doing emissions development work and say, okay, what were the events here that caused that emissions thing to ride up? And that's where I'm gonna go back over to my live link data and I'm gonna start overlaying other things on top of my vehicle speed. And I can see here's my air fuel ratio throughout the run and I can see this rich dip right here, right about the same time as I got this spike. So I have some sort of deviation in air fuel ratio control here and if I was to try and improve the emissions of this system, I would probably concentrate here first and look into what caused that so that I can start cleaning up the vehicle. All right, Matt, so you sent me the injectors. Yes. I did the testing and I ran them on my injector bench. So yes. when we run that, we've got the full workup on the injector. We run across all pulse widths, so I can capture all the way down to zero and when they first start opening and I, paint that entire curve of its behavior. And then I see how changing the voltage changes that behavior. The result of all that is an output file that I emailed to you. Yes. So what you got was what we both have on our screen here. Yes. So this looks an awful lot like a Ford racing fuel injector calibration summary report. Yep. All right. That's on purpose because I use the OEM, who's Ford in this case, their format for delivering data to give you the data. Okay, so now that we have the injector data input correctly, and we believe the injectors aren't gonna to contribute to any change in behavior in the vehicle, we now get onto the cool part of, what's the common changes that we would do to make this vehicle more fun to drive? Well, sure, the big thing that we have is we have a value file system that gives you a good starting point, and then you can kind of tweak from there to whatever the needs are of that. So we can go ahead and we'll walk through some of them. We'll load our value file first, so we'll select load all values and we have 93 octane in our vehicle out there. So we're going to choose our 93 octane 
for the 3.5. So this already started making the changes. It applies everything to it. And as you can see, this one here for our desired lambda watt, it's already made some fueling changes. If we want to look too, we can go down also in some of the torque request tables. We can see that we modified those already, and it'll give everybody a good starting point. And then we can look at some of the boost areas and all too. So we can look at some of our boost limits, and we have like our uh, max compressor outlet limit. So we've went ahead and made a lot of the changes for you guys, but still keep them in safe realms without moving them too far out of the way. Cool. So with these changes, now we would expect to see a difference in top end power. Absolutely. And hopefully no real change in the drivability region. Correct. Correct. It should still operate similar to stock um, with some enhancements and then definitely the, the gains of, of the performance. Okay. And through the magic of your tools and communications, we're able to put this file into the vehicle. Yep. So all we need to do is go back to the dyno cell, drop this file in the truck. Yep start it, run it, drive it, and now we can check our homework using the scanning tool. Yep, absolutely. Beautiful. After changing some hardware on our vehicle, we of course needed to make some calibration changes to the ECU to account for the physical changes in hardware. After all, the whole point of calibrating an ECU is to make it match the physical behavior of our engine and vehicle together. So Matt was able to go through and do that using the SCT Advantage software, using the data we recorded in LiveLink. We went round and round, made a couple of iterations, and we think that we're finally ready to check our emissions. We feel like it's running pretty clean. So today, our goal is to come in here in the morning, the vehicle soaked overnight, and we're ready to do another cold start FTP test using the Mustang dynamometer and the tailpipe emissions equipment. Now with the configuration updated to show both files on the same graph, we can see that our speed traces were pretty consistent, test one to test two. So we drove the same trace, we worked the vehicle the same way we worked it in both cases, but our accumulated emissions, you can see these two lines that separated a lot right at the very beginning here. So this steep accumulation of emissions here on one test is not there on the other test. So clearly, the calibration work that we did made a difference to what we measured at the tailpipe. So this begins to become the way that we have a little bit more confidence to show up at our certification laboratory with a vehicle or a program for testing. Now, as your non-attorney spokesman, I'll tell you, the way the EPA is still currently written their opinion on reasonable basis, this is not a 1065 lab. So this is not necessarily our get out of jail free card, but this sure as heck is directionally correct. So it's showing that we're going out of our way to take some measurements and that we are seeing that measurements generally get better. They may or may not believe us on that, but if we go to a cert lab, that will be the evidence that the EPA will accept. This is the homework we're doing before we go take that test to make sure that we pass. Matt, what did you think about our process over the last couple of days here? It's been great. We were able to gather all the data accurately um, through our data logging software, Sensors Inc. device, our precise uh, injector calibration data that we had uh, from you as well. Everything just fell together nicely and we have precise data. Yeah, so we're trying to make that transition from tuning to calibration, right? It's, it's more science than art if we really get down to it. And our industry has been facing ever increasing pressure for emissions compliance. And really we wanna be responsible. SET, you guys have been doing a really good job being a good example lately, showing companies what it can look like when we do it right. And so we're environmentally responsible, but we're still bringing smiles to the customer, right? We, we bring that value to them. So with that, I, I wanna give a heartfelt thanks to some of our sponsors who made this all possible. So the guys at Mustang kind of helped us bring this whole video together. SCT, you guys are hosting us here. That's pretty cool. Well, and thanks to you as well um, for the injector data and everything. Your contribution toward this whole project has been invaluable. 
um, Sensors Inc. too for providing the emissions equipment with us throughout this process too to help put it all together. Yeah, the Dietrichs injectors, you know, they're pretty consistent. Uh, they, you know, we ran them on the bench flawlessly, no problem. Yep. So, you know, getting that data and putting it right into your software where your tool just accepts that directly. Yep. Couldn't have copy made the process easy. Yeah, yep. copy, copy and paste, and brother. Paste. Till next time. I'm Matt Alderman from SCT. And I'm Greg Vanish from Calibrated Success. Thanks for sticking with us on this project and stay tuned.